descriptors. There will be time for questions halfway through this webinar and also at the end, so please post your questions in the chat box on the right hand side. As you can imagine, webinar platforms at the moment are very busy and there is a chance that we may experience bandwidth problems. A recording of this webinar will be made available on our website, so if we do have problems, you will be able to continue watching the webinar as a recording on English.com. So with that, I'll leave you with Tim. Thank you, Richard, and a great pleasure to be doing this second webinar in our series. Um, today's topic is mediation and young learners. As uh, Richard explained, there's, there is a chat box where you can enter your questions as I'm talking. Um, you can also feel free to uh, enter ideas and suggestions that might come to mind um, when I talk through the concepts because um, uh, this can be an exchange. Obviously, it's a large-scale webinar, so I'll be talking for most of the time, but you have these uh, points in the middle and at the end where we can uh, take questions. So um, the structure of today's talk is uh, firstly to review the concept of mediation, what do we mean by mediation in the Common European Framework of Reference, and what might be the relevance to uh, young learners, um, especially at primary, but also lower secondary. Um, then we can look at some uh, concrete examples of uh, mediation happening in the young learner classroom. And as with the uh, first webinar, uh, I'll be approaching this from the point of view that mediation is something that already happens in successful communication. It might be newly uh, described in more detail in, in uh, the work that we're going to look at, but um, in any communicative setting, there will be mediation going on. So we can look at examples uh, of, of how this happens in the classroom and how we could enhance it. Um, and also, Number three here, we've got considerations and caveats. So, so considerations according to appropriacy to age and to uh, learning needs um, and educational context. Right, so um, let's firstly look at the conceptual side and the potential relevance of that. Um, I'm, I'm going to review a couple of slides from last week just to make sure we're, we're up to speed with the concept. Um, this has arisen from uh, an update to the Common European Framework of Reference. We'll all be familiar with the levels A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Um, and those levels are illustrated with can-do descriptors. So what can people do in any given language? Uh, it's it's um, language agnostic as a framework. Um, and the new volume, the companion volume, brings all of those can-do statements together in one place and uh, extends and enriches that collection of uh, descriptions. Uh, and one of the biggest areas added um, in, in terms of can-do statements at the different levels uh, is mediation. And that's why this is news now, because we have a, a, a richer resource to refer to when thinking about this area with our learners. So my metaphor here on the slide is uh, if the CFR in, in its original publication in 2001 was a map of communicative competence and activities, uh, we've, we've uh, enriched that map, made it more detailed in the update, in the recent work, in the companion volume. Um, and, and one of the things to re remember about the CFR is that it, it because it, describes communication and communicative activities, regardless of the language, it is very much focused on real world communication. And uh, it uses categories that are different to um, our traditional four skills, which we're used to working with, which are a very practical way of uh, organizing courses. And we're so used to using listening, reading, speaking, and writing as ways of organizing courses. Um, it's almost, um, uh, taken for granted. And of course, this is uh, very useful in assessment as well to use those four uh, areas as, as areas of communicative ability. But uh, the way that the CFR looks at it is to um, think about reception um, as in comprehension, which will include listening and reading, uh, production where you are um, formulating your message, 
Um, and this can be in speaking or in writing. Uh, you plan what you're going to say, you plan what you're going to write, and you do it. Um, in spoken interaction, of course, there is listening and speaking going on. You're uh, taking account of what your interlocutor says and responding to that in pair work or whatever. And of course, the other side of that is written interaction, where you read and respond uh, in chat in, and in emails, and um, certainly more relevant now than perhaps in the 90s when this scheme was first formulated, because uh, most of our writing online is interactive. Um, and there are scales now added in the CFR for online interaction, which again might be uh, relevant to look at even with younger learners. But mediation was never described in terms of can-do statements before, and that's what's been added uh, in a significant part of the new work. And it relates to the, uh, the development of new meanings with and for others. So um, it, it quite often uh, involves the integration of skills in a fluid way. Um, it might be that you've listened to something or read something and you're explaining it in your own words, in spoken mediation, in written mediation. Um, but it might also mean that uh, in a spoken task, uh, you are adapting your message so that the, the uh, people listening to you uh, have a better chance of understanding it. So you're thinking about the uh, the communicative needs of the people you talk to, the people you write to. And so um, it very much places the language user as a social actor, not, not in isolation. It's how you, how you are adapting your message to, to others and processing ideas that you have understood. So um, this is a, a, a level of integration of the four skills and uh, with very much a focus on meaning and um, not just uh, straight transfer of meaning, but how you adapt it yourself. So um, again, one more slide from last week to recap. Uh, mediation in the CFR is uh, split into three categories of communicative activity. Mediating a text, uh, as I just explained, this can include relaying things that you've understood, uh, summarizing things, synthesizing information from different sources, and uh, we can begin to see, okay, this might also apply in the young learner classroom if you're talking about a story that you've heard or read or watched um, and and helping someone understand that uh, in pair work or, or something like that. Uh, mediating concepts is uh, another key category where um, if you are collaborating with others, uh, mediation happens in the way you talk ideas through and come to new conclusions together. Carol, uh, sorry, um, uh, Meryl Swain uh, referred to this as languaging. Uh, it's the, the the process of talking things through and collaborating um, communicatively. And uh, finally, mediating communication itself um, is enhancing the effectiveness of that communication uh, it, by creating an atmosphere of acceptance of different cultures. Uh, we talk about pluricultural space because uh, plurilingual and pluricultural competence are your personal repertoire of uh, the languages and the cultures that you're familiar with. And uh, creating a space for that in a group is uh, an acceptance of the different perspectives uh, brought to that group situation. But can also be acting as an intermediary um, and facilitating communication uh, and disagreements as well. So um, the traditional dictionary definition of mediation is encapsulated in there, but it's only one part of it. We see that this is a much broader concept that the CFR is offering us. Um, and we can start to pick out concrete examples and think about uh, relevance to uh, uh, building um, or laying the groundwork for these competencies uh, for our younger learners. Um, here's a, an extract from the companion volume uh, from the bottom part of a scale relaying specific information in speech. This is a mediation scale. And uh, we might pick out one descriptor from there to uh, familiarize ourselves with the concept. And um, here at A2, we've got can relay in language B in a simple way, a series of short, simple instructions, provided the original speech in language A is clearly and slowly articulated. And uh, it's important, firstly, to understand how the 
the, the CFR uses these terms. Language B and language A, it could be cross-linguistic, but it might just be the teacher's language and the, the, uh, the learner's language in terms of um, maybe something you've heard and then converting that into something you're saying. So language B and language A can, can be within the target language of English, but uh, you, you are reformulating, maybe, maybe paraphrasing um, in your own words and relaying that information, the content of the information. So, so the picture I used to illustrate that, which again, uh, we looked at last week, was uh, just the, the example of relaying instructions, uh, because this, this descriptor relates to that. And uh, there are opportunities in the classroom to set up routines in which uh, learners maybe uh, are given the responsibility, and that is uh, alternated uh, through the course, the responsibility to uh, repeat back instructions to their partner uh, just to check comprehension of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and so even as a part of classroom management, there can be mediation happening in the classroom. And teachers are the best mediators. Teachers do all sorts of mediation every day. So what is the potential relevance for younger learners? Um, firstly, I think we can look at this in terms of lifelong learning pathways um, and discovery learning in that uh, we might be presenting um, examples of uh, or, or creating opportunities for examples of this type of activity without necessarily um, expressly uh, saying to the learner, yes, you're going to mediate now. It's more to do with setting up opportunities to lay the groundwork for learners to build confidence in doing these kinds of things. And, um, and this relates quite clearly, I think, to uh, concerns of building 21st century skills, which is a, a, a common discussion at the moment. What do we mean by 21st century skills? Quite often people talk about soft communication skills being an important uh, skill set to develop for higher education and for careers ultimately um, and that, w that we can start in, in at any point in the educational pathway to look at those but um, it can be quite a nebulous concept soft skills uh, uh, whereas with uh, the mediation descriptors which relate to that kind of uh, taking into account your interlocutor taking into ac account the needs of others in communication we have some very concrete descriptors at each level which we can work with as an inspiration for uh, the the age appropriate learning outcomes aims and outcomes that we might develop uh, for younger learners so um, here I've referred to the, the descriptors as an inspiration perhaps because we would need to interpret them simplify them uh, appropriate to to the target group but they can also be an inspiration for activity design when we reflect on the, uh, the types of communicative activity they describe. Um, so we'll look at that in some more detail in uh, the second part of this talk. Um, another important thing to consider when looking at the, the background, the, um, the conceptual basis of looking at mediation is there is some work you can refer to if you're interested, um, a, a side project in parallel to the companion volume was to collate together everything we have or well a, a representative representative example of what we have from uh, European language portfolios for young learners in terms of can-do statements. So um, we know that the, the CFR was published in 2001 at the same time as the launch of the European language portfolio um, and this was a, a very much part of the same project. So that um, portfolios were developed for young learners to reflect on their learning. Um, this included a language passport, a language biography, um, and a dossier. And the language biography was where you would have just some selected can-do statements that were relevant to the course, uh, very simply um, expressed in a way that the young learners themselves could reflect on their achievements in the course and maybe uh, use stickers and other uh, ways of uh, indicating their success. And so the, the European language portfolio um, was uh, a project involving uh, thousands of professionals across Europe uh, developing these age-appropriate can-do statements. 
and we, we collated a, a, a sample of them together um, and put them into documents to map them back to the main CFR scales, the main CFR descriptors. And, and there were um, experts in the field as consultants uh, working on this project uh, to ensure there was a good um, uh, sense of relevance to the, the age groups that we were looking at. And um, if this was a very bottom-up exercise because firstly, we started by collecting what people had created in terms of portfolios uh, for learners. And um, from that, we were able to identify which age groups were represented by the sample. Um, it's not surprising that the majority fell in the seven, the seven to 10 age range and the 11 to 14 age range, which roughly correspond to pr primary and lower secondary um, for this type of portfolio approach. Um, that's not to exclude pre-primary, but uh, the project had the most evidence in these age groups. So that's what we looked at. And uh, we were able to map young learner can-do statements to the CFR. And, and it, it is a, another reference work that you can download for free from the Council of Europe website um, if you want to see lots of examples of young learner can-do statements from these portfolios. But the other important thing where we have new areas like mediation, which didn't exist in those portfolios, was to um, look at the descriptors for relevance to these two age groups. Um, that's where the, the expert consultants came in. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but um, just one interesting thing that came out of the project was um, we were able to see where the hotspots are in the CFR for um, the courses that have so far been developed for young learners with portfolios. Um, by well, you know, just counting the number of descriptors for those different age groups that people had developed in different areas, and so uh, and and what they were mapped to in the CFR. So um, some very popular areas uh, for young learners we found were reading for information. Um, you know, it could be reading with pictures of a of a garden or of a house. This is reading for information about a, a topic. Um, conversation obviously is uh, a key part of pair work and uh, uh, practicing dialogues. Information exchange, um, important part again of pair work and also um, peer presentations. Uh, describing experience, show and tell, uh, bringing the outside world into the classroom, very important uh, for young learners. And creative writing as a first step into literacy. We obviously, understandably, this is a a challenging area as well, but uh, seem to be very important in most of the portfolios that we saw. But you can also begin to see that um, in all of these types of activity, there might be opportunities for mediation to happen as well. If you read for information and then you talk about it in the conversation phase, um, then you are processing what you have understood and uh, putting things into your own words. Information exchange might involve information gap. And again, information gap can often be a mediation of a text because you are talking about something you've understood and helping someone else uh, understand that. Um, describing experience, it might be describing uh, something again that you have seen, um, a video that you or, or a story that you love. Um, th this can be part of uh, mediating a text, so uh, that can lead into creative writing, where you you uh, write your own version of a story, um, and so you, there, there's some sort of source text that is the inspiration for that, and that can involve mediation. So. Um, uh, before we get on to the practical examples, uh, you know, a final thing to say about uh, the document you can download for young learner descriptors. Um, where you don't have existing ones from portfolios, you'll see something like this, where you have a relevance for adaptation to ages 7 to 10, for example, or there's a, a document for 11 to 14 as well. And uh, the, the experts involved said, well, they looked at uh, can ask what somebody thinks about a certain idea. This this is a collaborative 
uh, activity, um, and it's clearly relevant for this age group. You know, this is something you can um, uh, provide models for your learners to do. Um, maybe gi giving uh, very simple instructions to a cooperative group. This might be partially relevant. You have to think about age-appropriate tasks for that. Could it be, uh, for example, instructions for a game? Um, and you, you've given someone the responsibility of checking everybody understands the instructions in their little group before they play the game. Um, so that's really a, a, a broad conceptual introduction, and we're about to look at practical examples. But before we do so, it's an opportunity to uh, uh, take any questions about the concept of mediation and, and what I've just covered. Um, so. Uh, if you've already put any questions in the box, maybe Richard will tell me, or if you have any questions now, you can just quickly write them. Um, and then we'll have further questions at the end. Hi, um, thanks, Tim. We do have um, a couple of questions so far, at least. Um, so one of them is just, a, I guess, a reference to a question about um, mediation itself, which is, is, um, is, oh, sorry, the question gone? Sorry about this. Um, is paraphrasing a type of mediation? Um, I would say that paraphrasing is um, something that happens as, as a feature of mediation. Um, so we've already talked about mediating text is, is not about just straight translation. It's not, it, might, it might be cross-linguistic, but it, it often happens within the same language, and it might be just putting things into your own words, which involves paraphrasing. But the, the, the focus on mediation is always on, are you uh, communicating a core meaning? Um, so it's very meaning focused. So I think an abstract paraphrasing task would not be a good approach to building mediation competencies. It would be better to be paraphrasing something because there is a communicative need, because there's an information gap of some kind, because you want to tell someone about something you're interested in, um, and and they have uh, you know an interest in that as well that. Uh, can be solved by you explaining it in your own words. So I'd say it's a feature of mediation rather than a direct equivalent of mediation. I think I've lost you, Richard. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me, Tim? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, is negotiating meaning part of mediation? I, I think yes, uh, that's um, it's fair to say. Um, this would be more in the realm of uh, mediating concepts. So we talked about uh, languaging as a, a, a way of uh, also thinking about that. Um, so negotiating meaning uh, will, if we think from a you know a socio constructed constructivist perspective of uh, how we. Uh, learn better through talking things through with um, our classmates, um, you know, in a Vygotskyan sense, uh, how this can help define concepts by uh, talking things through and negotiating those meanings together. Um, th that's uh, what we're focusing on with mediating concepts and collaborating to construct meaning is one of the scales there. Okay. Hey, Tim. So, um, it, Richard, shall I continue? Yes. Can you hear me? Continue, Tim. Yes. Okay. You're back. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'll continue with this, the because we're we're starting to talk about examples, which is what I wanted to do in the second half, and um, we we can look at. Uh, you know, mediation in the young learner classroom, not just as this, um, something new, but something maybe you will recognize that you do. And this is a reflection as much as anything, it, um, a, and a more focused reflection on what we do, uh, so that uh, we can use the descriptors and the scales as a way of interrogating what we do and thinking, oh, how can we enhance that uh, and create more opportunities for that to happen? Um, so we'll organize this around the three areas that I introduced of mediation. Uh, firstly, mediating 
a text or mediating texts. Um, we talked about relaying specific information as one of the scales. And I already gave an example of uh, relaying instructions, um, which might be for a task in the classroom. It might be for a game that uh, the, uh, the, the learners are going to play together. Um, and again, by assigning roles uh, and maybe rotating those roles through the course, uh, you, can, you can create clear responsibility for relaying instructions. Um, but also um, simple things like labeling pictures uh, for displays, for example. Um, there is a sense that you're extracting information to present to others. Um, so this is obviously at the very simplest end of relaying information, but it, it is um, laying the groundwork. And um, and so in constructing a poster uh, and, and labeling that, uh, the, the learners can be thinking about who is going to read that and how they can make it clear, how they can make their writing clear as they make their first steps into literacy. Um, and uh, guessing games. Uh, involve a relay of information. Um, so yes, you have pictorial guessing games like Guess Who, where you might describe the features of somebody you can see and they can't. Um, and that's uh, a pictorial source. But also uh, guessing games where you, you, you have a word that uh, your classmates need to guess and you, you try to define that. Um, maybe you know when, when learners are more confident in the language, they can be doing that kind of thing. Um, with information gap, and uh, this is uh, a type of relaying information. So again, you, you you may already be doing these kinds of things, but it's uh, something you can reflect upon. Okay, how often do I give them the opportunity to do that, um, and and to take responsibility about making sure someone has understood what they're saying about something. Um, then we've got tasks and routines for mediating text as processing text. Uh, so this takes it a step further than just relaying the main content. It's, it's um, adapting it in a way that you feel uh, will be, a be will be a, an appropriate presentation of that. So um, a very natural example here is retelling stories uh, and a lot of the material that we work with with uh, younger learners supports those stories with pictures. So it's a great opportunity to use the pictures as a scaffold to then retell the story uh, as best you can in the words that you have. Um, and again, that can involve uh, an element of creativity uh, because uh, Learners are, are often very keen to add their own details to the story, even adapt it in their own way, um, and point things out. Uh, and so uh, th that retelling of the story is not just a straight retelling. It's, it's adding a, a personal twist. Um, and, and here you're processing the text that you've understood. Um, Reenactments reenactment, re and drama, another example of this. Um, Obviously, we, we have to uh, be aware that um, there are educational contexts where that might not be possible in a group setting. If you have a very large uh, class, so that might not be practical to do uh, drama too often. But uh, you can think about how to even do this in pair work and reenact stories and, and um, use drama as a way of drilling back uh, key language from the story. You can have multiple students who are the same character of the story. Uh, but uh, once you've drilled back key language, there are um, you know, freer phases you can introduce where they, they add their own twists again to, to the story they've understood. Um, and so they, they are personalizing it. And that, this is processing the text. Um, and uh, as I've said, this could be in pair and share phases, um, which uh, can involve processing text from outside the classroom. Um, one thing that uh, we mean by a text is any kind of text that uh, is something you've understood as listening, as watching with video, and as reading. And, um, and so if, st if learners know a story even the one that they've heard in their first language that they can uh, tell to their partner, 
um, in a pair and share phase. Um, that, that, that is actually very natural cross-linguistic mediation. Um, making lists uh, is a simple uh, example and can be approached even at the, the lowest levels. Um, one thing I didn't mention was that uh, one of the things that has been added in the companion volume is uh, uh, some description of pre-A1 as a level um, to acknowledge that, that um, people have been developing descriptors that are you know, halfway step towards A1. And that can include very simple activities like extracting information into a list. Uh, if you think about Santa's list, this, this is a, a pure mediation activity because learners will research the things they want from various catalogs or websites and then put them into their personalized list for Santa. Um, but uh, in the classroom, it can be that uh, you, you might be listing the different animals that uh, you you encountered in this in a story, or the different fruits or, uh, and vegetables. Um, if that's a, uh, an area of vocabulary you're focusing on, uh, the point is is extracting that information from the story into your own list or labeling things uh, a picture. So trying to draw the things that uh, you had in the story that were your favorite characters and and labeling them. Um, and that can lead into making posters and displays, um, which again, uh, they condense information um, with pictures and words. And learners often enjoy doing that uh, and, and can talk about the, the posters that they've created, either individually or collaboratively. And that talking about it is is a pr peer presentation activity in itself. So it's further processing of of the text uh, with their own words. And of course, when when you have these opportunities to for learners to attempt things um, in an unscripted way on a topic that they're familiar with because they've made the poster, um, they they've drawn the picture. Um, this can also be a great diagnostic tool. Uh, to listen to how they are formulating things in the target language um, and, and diagnose what, where their needs lie to, uh, as they try to express themselves about this content. Um, and the final area in uh, mediating texts uh, is, of course, expressing a response to a text. So not just um, relaying the content or processing the content, but uh, how did you feel about that content? Um, so this is another scale title from the CFR, expressing a personal response to creative text. What you can do is look at uh, the descriptors in that scale uh, to get more concrete ideas of uh, what, what you could expect of learners at A1 or at A2 uh, in this area. But um, in general, uh, if we're just thinking uh, about laying the groundwork, then do we, create opportunities for learners to talk about their favorite stories or the, their favorite characters in a story and uh, how they felt about that. Uh, do they have, are we scaffolding them with the, the, the words they need to express how they felt about that? And as I said, it could be, it doesn't have to be a reading text, it could be uh, TV, video. Um, and yes, I, I saw the comment there, this is extremely, relevant to young adults as well, and favorite films. Um, again, it doesn't have to be that you saw the film in the target language. Uh, you, you, the point is you're expressing your reaction to that in the target language. And um, uh, with younger learners, you can scaffold this with emojis. Um, they could point to or, or circle emojis for different parts of the story, how they felt at different points in the story, and then relate those to the, the words they need to explain their reactions. So it's not just how did you feel about the narrative as a whole, but you can start thinking about the, the timeline of the story and how you reacted at different points. Um, and uh, then ad be adapting it. Uh, so 
a crossover with processing text and expressing a response is what do you think happens next in that story? How could you complete the story? Um, how might you change the ending to that? There's a, a creative aspect to this as well. Um, I mean, actually changing the ending, this is, we, we talked about 21st century skills and laying the groundwork for those. Uh, you may be familiar with the four C's of uh, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. And um, if, if uh, there's an activity where learners want to express how they would change a story, this is actually critically thinking about the story in a simple way, and it's creative. Um, so that's to wrap up with mediating texts. Um, the second category is mediating concepts, uh, which we talked about negotiating meaning as a feature of that. Collaborating in a group is the name of one of the scales, um, which uh, again describes what we can expect of learners, firstly in very simple ways at A1 and A2, and then going right through to the, the, uh, the high levels of the CFR. Um, but it might be uh, with younger learners in primary, you know, if you're dealing with learners at ages six to eight, um, what you're really doing is laying the groundwork for the conditions of collaboration. Uh, this is something we already focus on, I think, heavily with uh, younger learners. It's recognized as a key thing to um, build awareness of in young learners is uh, ways of collaborating, ways of sharing, uh, using visual prompts and maybe drilling certain language for um, you know, offering, uh, requesting, listening, asking questions, um, and being a collaborator. And craft-based and creative activities can be a, uh, an opportunity to um, for, for learners to, to demonstrate those skills that you're focusing them on with uh, maybe a well-prepared phase of the lesson. Um, constructive games, whether to, to complete the game, we need to collaborate. So, uh, for example, you might have team games where learners have differentiated roles. A uh, learner might be the one who goes to the board to put something on the board uh, to answer the quiz questions for the rest of the team. Uh, someone else might be monitoring the questions themselves. Uh, so differentiation of roles in a game uh, can be a good way of fostering a collaborative approach. Um, and I've mentioned drama again. Um, drama, uh, in if if you have the the opportunity and the time and the space to to set up a, an actual performance where learners prepare their performance and then perform it, uh, the preparation phase is all important because this is where uh, they agree what each of them are going to do. And of course, um, the use of props and costumes can really uh, build that sense of theatre if you have those available. But um, if you're in a larger classroom setting, it might be more to do with uh, preparing in a pair to, to perform to another pair. Um, you, you can set things up in a smaller scale um, with a larger group uh, um, working in smaller uh, dyadic uh, dra dramatic situations and so on. Um, so uh, it's something to think about. But uh, it, it does need to be followed by uh, a calming phase because there can be a lot of excitement that comes with drama and it can get uh, chaotic and uh, excitable and and so we can think of classroom management itself again as a an opportunity for uh, promoting the groundwork of mediation as a collaborative activity um, where you, again you might ass assign roles who is the uh, the monitor for clearing up the hats who is the monitor for clearing up the pens who is the monitor for clearing up the paper and uh, can you work together to make this a tidy space at the end um, so so what I'm talking about here is not necessarily exactly the activities that are described in the scale. Uh, they might be the pre-work to um, raise awareness of uh, collaborative approaches so that, that learners are prepared to do this more in, in their communication. Um, so, I mean, just uh, cycling through, um, I've got one last uh, area to talk about, and that's 
mediating communication itself. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned the scale of facilitating and uh, facilitating a pluricultural space. Uh, and what do I mean by this term? Pluricultural is a is is a, uh, a term coined by uh, well, it, it's favoured by the Council of Europe to um, signify individual repertoires in in uh, cultural awareness and creating a space for everybody to be able to share their their individual experiences. So um, we do see that uh, now there's a more conscious approach to diversity in the materials. Uh, published materials for young learners and you can really make the most of that uh, in the way that uh, you set up phases to reflect on different viewpoints in stories and materials. Uh, the, the, le the teacher themselves can be an example for that in welcoming uh, the, the different perspectives of uh, that, that, that learners themselves bring to the classroom and and so for, the, uh, for setting up the, the conditions for pair work and group work uh, where the, the learners themselves uh, facilitate a pluricultural space, it's simply about listening well and and sh show and tell. Listen well uh, is a principle of um, you know how do you uh, uh, share things with your partner and also take the time to listen to them um, and uh, re really focus on what they're saying and accept different. Uh, experiences and viewpoints in a in a cultural uh, conversation so um, all through this I've been talking about principles that might uh, uh, apply equally to young learners and adults as someone said in the chat and and, that's, and this is the the idea that um, we're laying the groundwork for lifelong learning um, and but there are considerations and caveats for appropriacy to learn learners uh, certainly um, in primary, uh, to what extent is this itself dependent on development in literacy and socio-cognitive development? And uh, and it is, is, of course, not linear. We can v visualize this, uh, for example, with communicative and linguistic ability progressing on, on one axis and literacy and socio-cognitive development facilitating that on another axis, but the actual development itself is is um, is more of a spiral. And um, you, you, some of you may be familiar with uh, Bruner's uh, model of a spiral curriculum, where you need to come back to things again and again uh, as you build confidence in them. And and that's the idea with uh, can-do statements: is that they they're a way of sharing um, uh, a task achievement focus uh, beyond you know, our, our grammar and vocabulary focus or, or the, the you know the systems of the language um, is oh we're going to do something again that's to that's focused on collaboration we did that last week we're going to do it again do you feel more confident and and so we we spiral back again and again to to these activities in different ways with different topics uh, to build the learner's confidence over time because learners all develop in different ways and at different paces you can never say oh we did we did mediating a text last week. Um, of course, it's something that you build over your lifetime. I am still getting to grips with mediating text myself, as I'm trying to do today. I'm try today, I'm trying to mediate the text of the CFR to you. Um, and learners have unique profiles of general competences, as well as language skills. And by general competences, this can, this can include, um, of course, um, socio-cognitive aspects. Um, so we have to be aware that, uh, especially with tasks that involve collaboration, for example, there will be learners who are more comfortable with that and learners who are less comfortable with that. Um, and, and that uh, perhaps we need to group those learners together so that there can be supportive interaction going on. Um, we, we can differentiate roles so that um, uh, different learners can play to their strengths and and so it does require um, some careful thinking about uh, setting up these tasks, uh, so that the expectations placed on the learners uh, are clear to them and um, are bounded. Um, so it's about clarity of what to expect and what is expected. It's very you know it's hyper important uh, for younger learners, um, 
uh, when, when they're moving out of their comfort zone, um, they'll, they'll be used to sitting in the same place every day the, the, um, with the materials that they like working with. Um, and, and some of these activities can be taking them out of the comfort zone. So uh, it's, it's to ex give clear numbered instructions. Um, knowing when it's fair to share is important. Le learners might be um, a bit put off by being asked to share things which they, they feel always oh, is, is my partner just copying my work. So uh, knowing when that's the, the point of the phase, the point of the activity and being clear about that and um, exactly what to do and um, when to do it. Um, I mentioned, you know, numbering your instructions uh, and, and actually getting the learners to repeat them back to each other um, before they start. And, uh, and so this is about preparing how to do it as well. Having uh, visual reminders of uh, you know, good body language for listening to your partner, um, may, maybe good ways of showing that you're listening or little words that you can use. Um, okay, so um, classroom management is a big part of this and it has to suit the group, the size of the group, the age of the group. Um, we can think about seating arrangements to uh, uh, create opportunities for collaborative work um, if you have the right uh, furniture available, but also taking into account that uh, at different age groups also uh, you, you might want to have the learners facing you as a teacher so they can maintain eye contact for most of the lessons. So you might just have a breakout area for the collaborative activities if, if the desks are all facing the teacher um, for, for, for the, the younger ones. Um, use of shared resources, uh, displaying principles for sharing and Again, maybe assigning responsibility to different learners to be monitors for different material, ensuring fair use um, rather than just a free for all and people uh, tugging each other's hair and swallowing things. Um, you, you can uh, maybe organize things with the learner's help and um, allowing for self-directed learning phases. So again, recognizing that not, not all learners uh, are you know, naturally um, collaborators, they, they need to have their time alone as well. And uh, it can be a great calming down phase after a collaborative phase uh, to, to uh, reflect on the topic with some coloring of uh, pictures related to the story or the drama that they did. Um, uh, something that they can uh, complete by themselves as the uh, reflection on the activity. And, and this comes back to where you might also use a simple uh, portfolio tool. Um, not all teachers are comfortable with that. Sometimes it can be seen as um, creating too much uh, uh, sort of bureaucratic work in the classroom. So uh, they have to be well-designed tasks that um, are simple enough for the learners to engage with and, and to be done in classroom time regularly. Um, but it might be that you just have one uh, learning aim that you've expressed for the lesson in a simple way and and that can be then reflected upon in this final phase um, you know I feel confident in this or I feel a bit more confident in this um, so it's helping learners to reflect on success by being specific uh, so um, this comes back to the the, the 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 consideration of how we uh, give praise um, Feedback that is specific is task focused rather than, for example, focused on talent. And uh, this is where I, you know I'd recommend looking at uh, Carol Dweck's concept of um, growth mindset. Uh, in that effective feedback that is very much about aspects of the task and the best way to do them. Um, and okay, this when you give feedback, oh, you did this particularly well. Um, you you might do it better by doing X, Y, Z, rather than you know praising a particular uh, student just generally, um, so that they they feel that their success is attributable just to talent, for example. Um, that that's not helpful for for the other learners who feel that they're maybe they feel weaker than the stronger learners who got the praise. Um, or that the stronger learners got the praise and they feel they have to live up to that now, and they feel a lot of pressure. So it's taking the, the focus off the learners and, and onto the task um, as a way of giving feedback. 
and um, revisiting those key ideas and values regularly that, that are suggested by the mediation descriptors, um, those, four, those three areas of uh, you know, thinking about how you help someone else understand something, thinking about how you collaborate, thinking about how you accept different viewpoints. Um, so um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, there may have been comments or there may have been more further questions that came up uh, as I was talking about these concrete examples. Um, and uh, we'll also in a moment just talk about the follow-up webinars that are coming, which will in, in look at areas such as assessment. So um, maybe Richard, if you're there, you, you, if you had any questions that you saw in the chat um, that you might want to relay to me. This is where Richard has to relay specific information to me. Can you hear me, Tim? Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Richard. Is that a yes? You can hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, actually, we've just got one that's come up, which is what tasks can help students with individual programs? So um, can you give me a bit more context there? Um, I think if, if a questioner could could add more context, um, we can find out. Um, we do have um, some other questions which have come in. Uh, sorry, just looking through the questions. Can translating into our language be the first step to mediation? Um, I wouldn't say it's the first step. It's, uh, I mean, tran informal translation is, uh, a, a, a part of the the mediation scales, um, but it it is not about uh, developing translation skills. It's about how you um, express things you've understood. So it could be a first step in that uh, maybe you have interests that you, uh, that, that that you are wanting to share. So young learners are very uh, motivated to talk about their own interests. But it, it may be that the source texts that you've researched on the internet um, are in your L1, and you want to summarize that in L2. So that could be a, a very authentic first step into mediation, yes. Um, the focus is not on translation, more on um, maybe summarizing uh, and, and uh, highlighting the most interesting points of, of a topic that you might have researched in L1. Um, we have had one actually which just came up, which is about um, if you could comment on some suggestions around distance learning um, in the context of mediation. Yeah, yeah. so um, distance learning um, will involve phases of uh, synchronous um, uh, teaching and learning uh, like we're doing now. It's live and it, it's phases of asynchronous. And um, with the asynchronous phases, uh, one of the strengths of that is it is very content focused because uh, you might be looking at content together on a platform and it, uh, pulling in media um, that again could be media that, that the learners themselves are interested in and using that for the learners to respond to. So it can be an opportunity to do some uh, authentic project-based learning with the platform you're using um, that, so that uh, learners can maybe respond to a text that you've chosen or that they've chosen um, and they might be responding to that asynchronously uh, in, in a community wall, in chat, or in developing their own video that they post to the platform. Uh, they might be uh, responding to that synchronously. You might be uh, conducting the webinar and the learners will summarize something to you and, um, and you, you, you can uh, give feedback on how they are approaching that. So um, I think actually there are plenty of opportunities for mediation to happen. Once you orient yourself around a content focus, um, uh, this can be in parallel to a, a language practice focus. This will ov obviously be part of any course is to uh, have uh, phases where you're 
focusing on rules of grammar and uh, mobilizing them in examples. But uh, when you're on a content focus and you're uh, doing something creative like a project, um, distance learning can be a, a way of sharing material that the learners have, have uh, responded to and then develop their own um, extension to, for example. Okay, um, I can't hear Richard now, but uh, I think I am coming here. back. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay, sorry. And we just actually had one question in, which is around, um, um, I've worked in several schools and noticed that some teachers box up students into successful and unsuccessful at the start of the school year and then adjust them accordingly. How can you avoid that attitude? And admittedly, this is more wider than just mediation. So this is actually separating groups. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, certainly this this uh, is about changing a culture in a school. Um, if you're if you're boxing up learners into if you're approaching differentiation in that way, um, I think uh, it's good to have uh, opportunities to share ideas on how you can approach differentiation in a more integrated way in your classroom. Um, again, this will come back to uh, aspects of sociocultural theory, uh, sociocognitive theory, sorry, and, um, you know, a Vygotskyan approach where it is actually beneficial to uh, uh, group learners in, in ways where the stronger learners can um, scaffold the, the uh, contributions of the what are perceived as weaker learners. But what we mean by strong and weak, again, should be nuanced because the, every learner has a unique profile. So um, I, th I think it's, it, it is, it's not very helpful just to label learners as strong and weak. I think um, through setting up activities where roles are differentiated, you can begin to see ways that uh, learners can play to their different strengths and, um, and be more integrated in your approach to differentiation in the classroom. Thank you. I'm just putting another one on the chat, which is um, how can we encourage students to give feedback during les lessons? Some may be shy. Yeah, and I, and I think this comes back to the emphasis on um, task rather than on, um, you know, general praise or general feedback. Um, so the more specific you can make it, uh, the more objective it becomes, and uh, the shyer learners uh, will, will have something to uh, scaffold their, the feedback they're giving. So it might be that you just have a, a, a monitor situation where that learner has been given one thing to look at uh, while their classmates d uh, perform a dialogue, and it might be the, the use of a certain uh, aspects of vocabulary um, and that that can be a form focused level of feedback but also if you're looking at feedback on things like mediation activities um, you might have set up uh, some uh, useful uh, behaviors in terms of phrases to use and so on and again monitoring for that rather than just saying uh, giving feedback on the whole task and uh, sort of in, uh, unfocused feedback I think um, be, be giving specific parameters can can help the less confident learners just to uh, be objective and, and say yes well, well I saw evidence of this in in what my partner did or what the the group did okay thank you well we've come to the top of the hour now and actually the last there are two questions which cover essentially I guess what we may be covering in the future webinars one was one is me does mediation help um, critical thinking uh, and secondly, was on mediation and assessment. So I don't know if you want to speak about yeah. um, the upcoming webinars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, I'll just um, see if I can share my screen uh, so that I, we can show the dates as well. Um, just one moment. Can you see that now? Forthcoming webinars. Mm, it hasn't heard yet. Okay, um, well, um, we will have two forthcoming webinars in this series. Uh, the first one will, uh, will be on the 16th of April, um, and that's how can mediation support academic and career skills. And so, yes, we will, 
yeah, so um, that's an area where we can look at um, the relevance to critical thinking um, because uh, with mediation descriptors, we have um, very specific things to look at that we can uh, set as learning goals for our learners in the way that they uh, collaborate in, in tasks that might be problem solving tasks that might be looking at uh, uh, topics critically together. And so we'll discuss that in in uh, the, the first webinar. And then uh, on Thursday, the 23rd of April, we'll be looking at uh, mediation and assessment. Um, and think, thinking about this in terms of, uh, of course, this is a new area of description in the CFR. It doesn't automatically translate into um, an isolated high stakes mediation test. Uh, we, we should be thinking of assessment broadly in terms of assessment for learning, um, in, in terms of the feedback we give, in terms of the criteria that, that could become a part of productive skills assessment, for example. Um, and, and remembering that mediation is not just a fifth skill to add on top of speaking, listening, reading and writing. Um, as we saw at the beginning of this webinar, it's an aspect of how we mobilize those skills. And so um, when we're thinking about assessment, it might be an aspect of the criteria that we use in assessment to uh, as success criteria, especially for task achievement. So that's something we'll discuss on that in that webinar on the 23rd of April. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and thank you all for attending um, and coming to listen to um, mediation and young learners. Um, Tim, thank you so much for that, taking us through the particular challenges, I guess, of, of introducing uh, the concept to, uh, to young learners. And um, we look forward to seeing you all on the 16th of April, I think, which is for the next webinar. Great. OK, yeah, I've really enjoyed it today and great to see so many attendees. Um, thank you all for coming and I hope some of it was useful. Thank you very much. OK, bye.